So continuing with our uh, urinary lecture, we're talking about the different processes that occur in the kidney. So we talked about the nephron as the structural and functional unit of the kidney, right? So that's that network of tubules starting with Bowman's capsule and ending with the distal convoluted tubule. Um, I have that handout that I put in the folder that has a picture of the nephron with the capillaries around it. So it's really, really important that we remember the essential parts of the nephron. And there's not a lot of great pictures that show the two parts together. Got a lot of junk on my computer here. Stop that. Oh my goodness. So I'm just going to go to that real quick again. Just this diagram. So we remember this diagram here. So remember, blood comes in to be processed by the nephron. So the nephron is this beige structure, but it's not the collecting duct. Remember, the collecting duct is not part of the nephron. So we have Bowman's capsule. It's the first part of the nephron to receive fluid that's squeezed out of this capillary, which we call the glomerulus. It receives this fluid, and then it sends it to the proximal convoluted tubule. Then it travels down the loop of Henle, so we have a descending limb and an ascending limb. Then it becomes the distal convoluted tubule here, and that's the end of the nephron. Then when it enters the collecting duct, that's no longer part of the nephron because there's several nephrons we can see that hook up to the collecting duct. So this whole beige structure is the nephron. So we have a relationship between the nephron, which is the structural, structural and functional unit of the kidney, and these blood vessels. So the blood vessels, just like we saw in the respiratory system, right? We had the pulmonary capillaries wrapped around the alveolus, and we had this exchange of gases, right? Dumping off of carbon dioxide to the alveolus and picking up of oxygen from the alveolus to the blood. The same thing is occurring here, but we're talking about water and electrolytes and amino acids and glucose and sometimes waste products like metabolized nutrients or metabolized drugs that a person is taking, like antibiotics. If you've ever noticed when you're on like a heavy antibiotic for a strep infection, you might notice your urine has kind of a strong smell to it. Or our patients, when we go in the bathroom after they've urinated, when they're on certain antibiotics, it has a strong smell because they're metabolized through the kidneys. Coffee. Oh, I haven't noticed that. I've had patients that drink the coffee all day long. A lot of coffee, and they have a strong. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's a lot of coffee then. Okay, so um, picking up in the notes then, filtration then is the first process where we're squeezing fluid out of this holy leaky glomerulus, and it's entering Bowman's capsule. So when we're just squeezing it, think of like a water balloon with holes in it. It's under pressure, and as long as we have, like we're hooking our water balloon up to the, to the hose, we have constant pressure coming into the water balloon, and that fluid squeezes out into Bowman's capsule. So it's non-selective. So anything that's dissolved in the plasma is going to enter Bowman's capsule. So do we want to urinate away our sugar and our amino acids, which are essential for our building blocks for hormones and connective tissues and everything? No. So it's getting filtered out right away into Bowman's capsule, but we got to get it back to the blood. Do we have blood vessels near the first tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule? Yes. So they can receive, via active transport, those substances that need to stay in the blood. And again, the key things that need to stay in the blood is water, glucose, and amino acids and sodium. We do need sodium, right? We looked at that all semester with the action potentials. We need sodium and potassium, right, and calcium for action potentials, muscle contraction, nerve conduction, right? So we need those electrolytes to go back to the blood as well. So those are carefully regulated by active transport, special proteins that are in the walls of these tubules. So right away when, when fluid enters, we call the fluid filtrate. When it enters Bowman's capsule, we call it filtrate. When it enters a proximal convoluted tubule, 100% of the glucose goes back to the blood, reabsorbed. 100% of our amino acids back to the blood, reabsorbed. That's what the process is called, is reabsorption. Because we absorbed it once through the digestive tract to the blood. Now we're spilling it out of the, out of the blood here. Now we're going to reabsorb it back to the blood 
in the proximal convoluted tubule. So that's where most reabsorption occurs is in the proximal convoluted tubule. So again, what is filtered out? Only the plasma. Anything that is large cannot squeeze through those tiny holes of the glomerulus. So we do not see proteins, white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets. And on that handout I gave you that has this picture on the front of it, we talked about that, right? Number one, this non-selective movement is called filtration. And then the old, only substances that are not filtered, again, are red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and pro proteins due to their size, due to their large size. So the next process then, another thing I should mention here if we go back to our PowerPoint notes, is that this process of filtration is so efficient, we're constantly squeezing plasma out of the blood from the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule that our entire plasma volume passes through the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule every 30 minutes. So if we did not have any reabsorption occurring, we would pee out our entire plasma volume in 30 minutes. That's how fast and efficient these millions of nephrons are in each kidney. They're, they're very highly efficient, highly metabolic um, cells making up these nephrons, and they're very busy doing their thing. So need lots of ATP for the, that active transport of some of those um, ions. So this filtration is driven by blood pressure. So the higher the blood pressure, the more the squeeze, right? If I want to get, like, you know, the old-fashioned sprinklers, right, or the hoses with the holes in it, right? If I want to get a higher stream of water to water my lawn, don't I just crank up the faucet, right, to make a taller stream? Well, that's, I'm just adding more pressure, more volume to that blood vessel. So if someone has high blood pressure, they're doing damage to their kidneys because they're increasing the pressure in that delicate glomerulus, and eventually that glomerulus is going to be damaged, those delicate cells, and they're going to be leaky, and we're going to start to see other things in the blood that shouldn't be there. So we need to control blood pressure. When you talk to patients like yesterday, we had, you know, there's some young people at the jail that are not taking care of themselves, and they have high blood pressure in their early 40s, and they're like, oh, yeah, I got, you know, my blood pressure is 160, 170, and, you know, I, I'm not taking my meds because I'm kind of not paying attention to that right now. And it's like, you know, you just have to remember you're, you're doing damage to your heart and kidneys when you don't control your blood pressure. And this is why that glomerulus can't handle that pressure over the long term. So they end up on dialysis if they don't get that under control. <clears throat> okay, so 100% of the glucose and amino acids, we need to get back to the blood. But let's talk about these pressures first. So uh, when we talk about pressures at the glomerulus, hydrostatic pressure is a pressure that is due to fluid. So the more fluid, the more hydrostatic pressure. That's what HP stands for. HP glomerular capsule just means the, the pressure due to fluid in the glomerulus is 55 millimeters of mercury based on a normal blood pressure. Osmotic pressure is the suck of fluid into the glomerulus due to solutes that are present in the glomerulus. And what's the number one solute in our blood that we said drives blood pressure? Do you remember which one that was? That's one of them, but there's a bigger solute. It's not even a solute. It's not dissolved. Remember we talked about albumin? Albumin is a big plasma protein that helps draw fluid into the, into the capillaries of our bodies. And if we don't have enough albumin because of liver disease, all of our fluid leaks out of our blood vessels and we get a bunch of edema. That's what happens in people that have liver failure. So anyway, any, whatever solute you have, whether it be a plasma protein or sodium from eating a supersized McDonald lunch with salty fries and salty burger, right, that's going to pull fluid into the blood vessels. And that's why we tell people if they have high blood pressure, limit your salt intake, right? So there is some suck of fluid into the glomerulus because of solutes in, the, in that fluid, in the plasma, that pull some fluid from Bowman's capsule into the glomerulus. And then we have some fluid in Bowman's capsule that puts pressure on the outside of the glomerulus and pushes some fluid in. So we have kind of this, this push and pull of fluid at the glomerulus. But if we add up what's acting out of the glomerulus, we have 55 acting out, we have 30 sucking in, and 15 being pushed in 
from Bowman's capsule, what's the difference between those numbers out versus in? 10. So we have a push of 10 millimeters of mercury acting out of the glomerulus. So we should always see movement of fluid out of the glomerulus. So not all of the fluid leaves the glomerulus, right? Because we can see there's some, you know, there's a decrease in pressure. So that's why we have an efferent arterial. So we keep some fluid in the glomerulus because we don't want to dry out our blood vessel, right, in the kidney. So there's some fluid that leaks, but not all of it. Okay, so we have a push of 10 milli, milli 10 millimeters of mercury. So we call that the net filtration pressure. Just like on your paycheck, you have a gross pay, which is your, your wages times the hour you worked. But is that what you get paid? Is that what you get to spend? Unfortunately not, right? We know the taxes and insurances and Social Security have to come out. So we get our net paycheck. Our net pay is what we get to actually cash in at the bank and spend, right? So the net filtration pressure is the pressure that actually acts outward on the glomerulus and pushes fluid out. And that can increase. Your net filtration can, in filtration can increase if I have too much fluid in my ve vessels from too much salt, if I have high blood pressure, or it can decrease if I have really low pressure because I'm dehydrated, or a person is bleeding and losing plasma and red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. This number can go down. And that's not good for the kidneys, right? If we have less fluid entering the kidney, less filtration going on, that's not good either. So reabsorption is when this fluid now is squeezed out, it enters the proximal convoluted tubule, we need to get those good things back to the blood. We do not want to lose them to the, to the urine. So reabsorption is a selective process of moving sodium, amino acids, and glucose, those are the key things, and water back to the blood. Then, when we get down into the loop of Henle, some of our kidneys have really long loops of Henle that dip down way into the medulla, and their job is to um, focus on water reabsorption or not, just concentrating our urine if necessary. Like if there's not a lot of fluid in the environment, like we're not drinking or we have vomiting and diarrhea, then we're not going to... Um, Loses, we're not going to leave as much fluid and salt in the loop of Henle. We're going to pull it back to the blood. So if we look at the loop of Henle, the descending limb is only permeable to what fluid? Or to what substance? Water, right? So it only has transporters for water. And then as it makes its turn at the bottom and rises up, it's only permeable to salt. The ascending limb can only allow salt to be reabsorbed. And the benefit of that is we can get a really concentrated fluid at the bottom of the loop of Henle. So when we're down here, if I'm losing a bunch of water as it's descending down, it's really concentrated down here, right? And then as it comes up, if I'm losing salt, it becomes more dilute again. And then I can kick in hormones to determine if I want to keep it dilute or do I want to make it more concentrated as it comes back down. And that's kind of an advanced concept that we'll get into in advanced AMP. So we're not going to go into the details of that, but just trust that it's very important that we have this only permeable to water to make it really concentrated because it's losing water and then all the salt is in there. So when we lose water and keep the salt in, wouldn't it be concentrated? Doesn't that make sense? And then as it goes up, we're losing salt and keeping the water so then it becomes more dilute. So there's a purpose to that, but we don't need to analyze the details at our level. Just know the differences between the descending limb and the ascending limb as far as what is permeable. So we're losing water in the descending and losing salt in the ascending. So we're taking it back to the blood. And if we again look back at that diagram, there's blood vessels that wrap around the loop of Henle and this is called the vasa recta the vasa recta. So you can cross this out, and I think it, I did fix it on your handout, but it, it says paratubular capillary network. It is an extension of the paratubular capillaries, but it has a special name called the vasa recta. So on this, on the handout that looks just like this diagram that I put in Blackboard, you'll see I changed that name to vasa recta. So that will pick up water and, so, and sodium as it leaves the nephron and goes back to the blood. 
So then we get up to the distal and uh, the distal convoluted tube and collecting duct. That's where we have hormones kicking in. So we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. So by the time we get up to the to the top of the ascending loop of Henle, now tubular secretion can kick in. So we talked about filtration where we're getting things out of the blood. Then tubular reabsorption in the proximal and loop of Henle, that is putting it back to the blood via reabsorption. Now secretion is putting it to the nephron. So there's certain things that are actively secreted like hydrogen ion and potassium ion are secreted, as well as urea. Urea is a waste product. When we eat protein, it gets broken down and processed into urea. And certain drugs, and I don't mean illegal drugs, it just could be you know, whatever drugs that you're taking for whatever reason. They, we find those in the urine. And excess hormones we talked about with the endocrine system. Any excess hormones that aren't being used, don't, aren't binding, those end up in the urine, and that's normal, right? So hydrogen, and this is how we can control, this is how the kidneys can help control our pH. If our pH is too high, the kidneys will secrete hydrogen ion. And when I test that urine sample, it's going to be more acidic. So if a person has emphysema, COPD, we said they trap carbon dioxide, which makes carbonic acid, which releases hydrogen ion into the blood, they're going to secrete that excess hydrogen ion into the urine, into the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, and they're going to have an acidic urine. And that's going to be a normal finding in someone with COPD because they have too much carbon dioxide on board and the kidneys are trying to fix it. They're trying to compensate for that low pH in the blood. Potentially, yeah, potentially. A lot of the smell of urine, though, is ammonia, which is actually a base. So as, as it sits, um, the um, ammonia levels get higher as it's converted while it sits. Like when you throw a diaper, and with six kids, believe me, I've had a lot of diapers around our house. I always stored our diaper pails outside. They were always right outside the porch in a little diaper pail like the back door so my neighbor or the guests don't see that first thing they come in the house. But one time I went to visit a friend. Oh my gosh, she kept her diaper pail. She had a newborn. I went to visit her with her newborn. She had the diaper pail in the house and she must become nose blind to it. But when I opened the door to enter her house, I was just hit by the strong ammonia smell. Very, very bad. Best to keep those things outside. Same thing with poop diapers too. Like sometimes I will have relatives that come over that have babies and they throw like a poop diaper right in the kitchen garbage and you open that, it's like, oh my goodness, that's terrible. <laughs> ask when you go somewhere with your babies in the future, if you don't have any yet, ask where you want that diaper to be thrown away because not everybody, grandma and grandpa, want poop diapers in the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> and it twists, it helps. Yeah, th it's okay, but that moment that it's open, whew, <laughs> yeah. especially in a closed bedroom in the wintertime, I've never had good luck with indoor diaper pails. They've always given off, I have a very sensitive nose, a little bit of an odor, so I've just always carried them down and opened up the back door and threw it in the thing outside. And then they freeze out there and it doesn't really smell. What'd you say? Cat litter is getting better, though. So a lot of people keep them in the basement, so you don't have to smell it. Anyway, we're digressing again. So back to this. So hormonal mechanisms kick in. So the key job of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct is to be influenced by hormones so we can say, okay, we've got this urine that's coming up from the ascending loop of Henle. What's going on in the body that may need some adjusting of what's headed to the toilet, right? Because once it enters the collecting duct, it goes to the pelvis of the kidney, down the ureters, to the bladder to be stored until we're ready to urinate. So these hormones influence what the kidney's doing with this fluid. For example, ADH, it causes special proteins called aquaporins to be inserted into the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. And if we put extra water channels in those tubules, we reabsorb water back to the blood and it enters back to the paratubular capillaries and goes back to the blood. So it's the anti-P hormone, ADHs. Aldosterone acts as an extra transporter to get sodium back to the blood. So 
sodium is important because if I have sodium in the blood, water follows by osmosis. So that's kind of a secondary way of getting more water back to the blood is to pull sodium back because it's going to suck water with it by osmosis. Renin is produced by the kidneys to do a number, a number of different things. And again, we'll get into this more in advanced a &P, but just know that renin is secreted by the kidneys when blood pressure is low because it produces, um, it's, it creates a pathway to create angiotensin II, which is a vasoconstrictor. And when we make our blood vessels smaller, it increases blood pressure, right? If you decrease the space, around a fluid, doesn't it make sense? It would increase pressure. And it also increases, it causes more ADH secretion from the posterior pituitary. So if I secrete renin, I have vasoconstriction and more ADH secretion, which is gonna pull water back and keep our blood pressure up. So renin is really good for low blood pressure. ADH is good for low blood pressure. Aldosterone is good for low blood pressure. But then we have atrial natriuretic peptide that inhibits ADH production and sodium reabsorption, and that is good for a high blood pressure. So when the atrial walls are stretched with high blood pressure, too much blood volume, it secretes this hormone, which prevents reabsorption of sodium and water and keeps it heading to the toilet to get rid of it. So we have, if you look at these three first three hormones, ADH, aldosterone, and renin, those protect us from too, of, too low of a pressure. Because which is going to kill us faster, low blood pressure or high blood pressure? Low blood pressure. Because if you don't have enough pressure to get fluid up to your brain via your carotid arteries, you're a goner, right? You're going to pass out. How many times do people get up quickly from a laying position, especially the young women in here, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, everything just went black, right? That's because your carotid arteries didn't adjust yet to that change in body position to constrict and increase blood flow to your brain. So we know low blood pressure, very dangerous. A person can die and suffer kidney damage if their pressure is too low for too long. High blood pressure, we can hang out like that for a while, right? I've seen people in the 180s, 190s, even 200s coming in with that high of a pressure. Now, is that good long term? No, but can we make it for a while on a high blood pressure? Yeah, you can. So the body is very uh, intelligent in the sense of there's a lot more controls for a low blood pressure than there is for a high because that is what's going to kill the body quicker. So ADH, one thing to mention about this, ADH is the anti-P hormone, anti-diuretic hormone. So that means we're not going to pee. It's going to hold. It's going to increase that hormone to stop us from urinating. When would ADH secretion be high? Under what circumstances? When would the body say, "Stop the water works. We don't want any urination going. We need to hang on to any water that's entering this kidney. We need to reabsorb it back." What? High body temperature. And why would that be? Yeah, you're sweating, you're breathing more heavily when you have high body temperature, so you have more water loss through the lungs even. So yeah, anything that causes high body temperature, even if it's exercising, right, you're not going to pee as much because of the heat and the, the sweating, the fluid loss that occurs with that. So you would have increased ADH secretion as a result of that. What else? What else causes the body to lose fluid? Diarrhea and the other end? vomiting, that's going to cause an increase in ADH secretion. So what about alcohol? Do people ever wake up feeling a little dehydrated after drinking the night before? Definitely. And why is that? Have, have you ever noticed or heard of other people that have peed a lot while they're out drinking with friends? They have the same famous phrase, once you break the seal, right? Well, there is no seal. <laughs> what it is, is once you get uh, a high enough blood alcohol concentration, you block ADH secretion. And if I block the anti-P hormone, what am I going to do? And pee, right? Because ADH is not doing its job. You're blocking ADH job, preventing it from the anti-diuretic job of causing water to go back to the blood from the collecting duct. Instead, it stays in the collecting duct and heads right to the bladder. And we know that this, this kidney 
um, process of filtering our blood is happening constantly. In 30 minutes, our entire blood volume is passing through. So if we have continuous flow to the collecting duct to the bladder, we're going to need to empty our bladder a lot more often, right? And if a person looks at the fluid coming out of their body, it's clear because it's basically your plasma. You're peeing away your plasma when you have blocked ADH due to alcohol consumption, increased alcohol consumption. Same thing, coffee does the same thing. Coffee is a diuretic and it increases urination and as a result causes dehydration. So if a person needs to up their fluid intake, like I myself, you know, sometimes like when I'm working a long shift at the hospital, I'll have my big coffee mug and I'll be sipping on that all day and I won't have a sip of water all day. And then how often are you using their bathroom? And you were even talking about this, Nate, in a 12-hour shift, how often did you pee? Zero sometimes? Yeah. yeah, not good, right? We gotta take better care of ourselves. So um, the good thing you can do if you're gonna go out, let's say you're going to a bachelorette party and you know there's, or a bachelor party or just any kind of gathering where there's gonna be alcohol there, is you have a drink and then you have a glass of water. You have a drink and you have a glass of water. So you're replacing your fluids and by doing that, your blood alcohol concentration isn't getting that high. But let's say, heaven forbid, it does and you're at the end of the night and you're heading to bed, best thing you can do for yourself is to drink a big glass of water before you go to bed to replace some of that fluid that you lost. And that's what we do when people come in you know, with really, really high alcohol levels in the ER is we pump them full of fluids to replace that fluid loss and bring that blood alcohol level down. Okay, so um, like you said, caffeine. Another thing we give people that have heart failure and have too much fluid in their blood is Lasix. Lasix turns on the sodium reabsorption in the loop of Henle. So that's a special medicine that acts on the loop of Henle, so we call it a loop diuretic. And if they're in really bad shape and they're really full of edema, we give them this VIV. Other people, we just give them the pill and they even go home on that pill. And there's a lot of people that take Lasix. It's called furosemide. They take it at home every day to control their blood pressure. So urination, the term for urination is micturition. We talked about the term for having a bowel movement. It's called defecation. Micturition is a reflex, and it's at the sacral level of the spinal cord. So anybody that has damage to the sacral region of the spinal cord, which is that very end of the spinal cord, they're gonna have trouble with controlling their urine. And as people age, this reflex is damaged as well, and we call it a neurogenic bladder. When people have to have a catheter permanently in the nursing home setting, it's because this reflex is not under their control anymore. So we're constantly making urine. So we're constantly, so if we had no bladder, we would just be dribbling urine constantly out of our bodies. So the bladder is a convenient little storehouse that can collect this urine that we're constantly making. And then when it gets full enough, it sends signals, it stretches and sends signals to the sacral region of the spinal cord via uh, neurons. So here the blue arrows represent the stretching of the bladder wall from increased urine. And that sends an impulse that sensory receptors detect the stretch of this wall of the bladder, sends it into the spinal cord, and then we have a reflex. So the, the brain is not involved necessarily. So then it comes back via a neuron, which will cause contraction of the bladder. So that's the twinge we feel when we have to go to the bathroom. And then we have a voluntary somatic motor neuron that controls an external urinary sphincter. So there's an internal urinary sphincter, just like we saw with the, with the defecation reflex, that's smooth muscle. And then we have an external urinary sphincter that is skeletal muscle and it's under our control. So when we feel this twinge, this contraction of the bladder, that goes up to the cerebrum and tells us, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. And then you can inhibit that. You can consciously inhibit that reflex by saying, well, it's a little bit left of class, can't go right now. So you inhibit it, and then you don't feel that sensation for a little while. Then as you get up and say, oh, I'm going to run to the bathroom now. And then you get into the bathroom, and you're looking at the toilet, all of a sudden, this reflex kicks in. And now you're like, oh my gosh, i got to go to the bathroom. And you didn't realize how much you had to go until you're in the bathroom looking at the toilet. So what is, the, what is the consequence of that then for patient care, right? 
if your patient really has to go and they get to the toilet and all of a sudden it's running down their legs, are you going to be upset or frustrated? You're going to say, no, that's, that's the micturition reflex. And we waited too long, obviously, right? Because if they can't hold back that fluid in their bladder, it's probably pretty full. And that's why they lost it right when they saw the toilet. Just like children, too, right? When children get in there, they get to the toilet and they pee on the floor next to the toilet. And you wonder, you know, why did you do that? It's because of the micturition reflex. And what do we know about the different types of nervous system control? We have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Which one is in, in charge of urinating? If you're fighting and flighting, is that a good time to urinate? No, <laughs> it's not. So the body suppresses the micturition reflex. It suppresses the defecation reflex, right? Because you're in a fight or flight mode. And again, fight or flight mode, in today's society, I didn't do much fighting or flighting this week, but have I been exposed to stress at times throughout my week? Have we all been exposed to stress at times? Yes, running late for work, busy at work, whatever, right? So the sympathetic nervous system is kicking in and it's suppressing those reflexes. So sometimes when you're really busy at work, you can suppress the maturition reflex. Or like, when you're, like I said, when we were studying the autonomic nervous system, everybody's getting in the car ready to go on vacation and you're running around stressed out and then everybody gets in the car, they relax, I gotta go potty, right? Because now the micturition reflex is kicking in as they're relaxing. Or the same thing with yourself. If you have a long commute to work, you get in the car and you're like, okay, oh shoot, I gotta go to the bathroom, I forgot about that, right? Because then it kicks in as you're relaxing. So we have to pay attention to that with our patients and when they say they have to go to the bathroom, you need to be quick about it, not say, well, let me just get this done first, and we'll do this, and we'll do this, and then I'll take you to the bathroom. Your first question should be, how bad do you have to go? Should we do that right now? And then let them answer that. <clears throat> Another thing is, <clears throat> is when you have a patient that's rushing to the bathroom, a man, a male patient, elderly, rushing to the bathroom, and oh my gosh, I gotta go, I gotta go, and it's urgent, and they're starting to dribble, and they go 100, then you know what's, what's the problem there. Yeah, an enlarged prostate. So that bladder is really full, but they can only tap off the top 100 because of this stretched out bladder and the narrow urethra because of the prostate that wraps around the urethra that's enlarged. They can't squeeze enough through. There's not enough pressure. So they, they have enough volume to get 100 off, but there is chronically a large volume that remains in the bladder. So what do we do? Don't answer this, Nate, because I know you know the answer. What do we do with some of the others that work in maybe long-term care to see if there's residual urine in the bladder? Do you know what we do? Yeah, what are we scanning, do you think? Yeah, bladder scan. So we bladder scan. It's just a little ultrasound wand. CNAs can do it, and they scan over the bladder to see if there's fluid in there. And if there is, then what do we do? Catheter, a straight cath. So we just put the catheter in and pull it back out. And there's some people that live like that on a regular basis. Like if you watch that commercial about, I buy my catheters from Liberty Mutual or whatever it's called. <laughs> Not Liberty Mutual, that's a different thing. <laughs> American, whatever. Anyway, but some people, that's how they live. They have to insert a catheter every time they pee. There are young women that have to insert a catheter every time they urinate because I had a, a girl that I knew that was a neighbor of ours that she had a tumor on her spine in the sacral region of her spinal cord that did damage, so she had no control of her bowel or bladder. So she had to catheterize herself to, to urinate, and I don't know what she had to do to, to stimulate her bowels, but she had to really be careful because that those reflexes were off. And some people have to do rectal stimulation to get their bowels to move. I don't know what she did, but I mean, she may have had a, a colostomy actually, but yeah, it's a serious thing. That sacral region of the spinal cord is in charge of these very important reflexes. And when it's damaged, then these reflexes aren't working. Or they, you know, with aging, they don't work effectively. And then people need a, a catheter. <clears throat> so dialysis is when the kidney can't do its job. So the glomerulus is not able to function and filter properly and then reabsorb. Because if the kidneys are damaged, and what are the number one causes of kidney failure are what, do you think? Who are your patients that are getting dialysis? Nate, you can't answer this one either. <laughs> what? Drinkers? Drinkers? It's more the liver. 
the liver is what's damaged in drinkers. Actually, their kidneys are OK. Yeah. Some, yes, some medications are what we call nephrotoxic, which means they damage the kidneys, definitely. Lifestyle related, too lifestyle related. What? Mm, not really, actually. Obesity, but this, this obesity can cause something else, which causes kidney damage. High blood pressure, yes, high blood pressure is one. Diabetics is the other one, yep. Diabetes is a, is a number one reason we have people in with failed kidneys. Because high blood sugars and tiny blood vessels and nerves do not do well. It's not a good mix. High blood sugars need to be controlled or it just kills those kidneys. And smoking, too. Smoking and diabetes together is a toxic combination because it causes breakdown or not breakdown, buildup of uh, plaque in the vessels and damages those tiny blood vessels too. So causes uh, kidney failure. So that basically we take an artery and a vein in the upper arm and we connect them together. So the artery creates the high pressure and then the vein gives us the big volume. So we can use a really large needle and we can put high volume of fluid and make sure that we keep the, it has to be isotonic, right? We don't want to lose the good nutrients and all the good stuff in blood, but we want to make sure we pull the bad stuff from the blood. So people have to go through dialysis three to four times a week, and it's sometimes four to five hours at a time. From the time they get there to the time they leave, it's four to five hours. So that's like a part-time job. It's 20 plus hours that they have to dedicate to dialysis. So it's a big deal. And I was discharging a patient one time. He was living with his cousin, didn't really have any resources, wasn't working, didn't have a car. So and he came in with really, really high levels of toxins in his blood because he wasn't going to dialysis. So we got him all cleaned up. I mean, he was on death's door. And the doctor even said, you know, it's amazing you're still here, but we got you all cleaned up. We got you stable. He was in his maybe late 40s. So, so you're going to discharge, and, you, you know, here's the plan for your, your dialysis. You're going to go on this day, this day, and this day. Okay, sounds good. So I'm discharging him, and I'm saying, okay, so your, your dialysis is going to be at 6 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, do you have a, an arrangement to get there? Well, no, actually, my cousin is a cab driver and he works during that time. So how are you going to get to your dialysis? I don't really know. Oh, okay. Well, this is a problem then. We're going to discharge you and you're not going to dialysis because you didn't have a ride, didn't have a car. So we ended up keeping him another day, so I had to go back and tell everybody he's, he has no arrangement for dialysis, but he could go at 2 in the afternoon if we could get him set up at 2 in the afternoon. Well, that's going to take some time. So we had to keep him overnight, rearrange everything, and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, his cousin was available and could take him. What a simple question, right? But if you didn't ask it and you just do your boring discharge and you're disengaged from your patient because you're busy, which happens, he would have just been right back and never gone. So anyway, so they have this thing in their arm then. Once they, once they hook up the artery to the vein, it creates this large swollen vessel on the arm, which is called a fistula. And it's for people that have long-term dialysis. And I'll show you what it looks like. And it takes a little while to grow it. But again, it's, this is what they do. They, they move that together. And I'm trying to find a, a real one, not a cartoon version. Okay, here's a good one. See how large that vessel is? I don't know if you can see that or not. Let's see if I can find another one. Here's a really big one. Here's a really big one. That one's a little bigger than it should be. But here's a really big one. But that was one that was created abnormally. But here, this is a pretty good picture right here, if you can see that. So that's where they put that tubing in to get, you know, to save time so they can do large volumes of fluid exchange through that fistula. Now what happens if you're not a long-term kidney person, you're just someone who had some bad luck and your kidneys shut down for a while, you had what we call acute renal failure, which means it just happened all of a sudden and you're going to recover from it. We don't want to create a fistula. It takes months for that to grow. So well, then we just put it in your in a large line in your neck and a large, large vein in your vessel, or large vein in your neck, 
and then we do the exchange that way. Um, but the fistula is the best way to go because it's not going to get infected and it's a long-term kind of thing. But if you put your finger on it, it buzzes. You can just feel a zzz of fluid flowing through there kind of turbulently. You can feel that. And if you put your stethoscope on it, you can hear this large, it almost sounds like someone's taking a rubber mallet and hitting an empty dumpster. It's like boom, boom. Every time the heart beats, you can hear that sound. So that's an assessment you'll do on any, if you're going into nursing, on any patient that has a fistula. You're going to feel for that buzz and then listen for that pound, that large pound. It's really kind of bouncy, I feel like. Yeah, and that's just the high pressure. Okay. Yeah, it so gets builds up a strong. The blood the blood pressure. Yep, and it, and it, well, it's not scar tissue, but it, it strengthens the wall, that high pressure. Yeah. Yeah, you can shut them down. Yeah, you could shut it down and not use it because some people have non-active fistulas. But usually by the time they get to a point of a fistula, it's because their kidneys are shot. But I suppose if you had a kidney transplant, then you wouldn't need it. So, And people can go without uh, one kidney because when one kidney fails, the other one picks up the pace. So we have uh, that ability. So we don't notice symptoms of kidney failure until like 80% of the nephrons are shot. So they really can pick up the production for the failing ones. Yeah. So you know his lifestyle was pretty impacted by that. Yeah, did he get a uh, transplant then? Oh, wonderful. And how's he doing now? Yeah. Isn't that great? Yep, yeah, because it is very time consuming to, to be doing dialysis all the time. All right, effects of aging on the kidneys. The de kidneys decrease in size and because, of, and because they lose nephrons. The nephrons start to break down as we age. They're not as functional anymore. So then there's less blood, blood flow as a result of that because the body diverts blood to where it's needed. So if there's less functioning nephrons, then the blood capillary supply to that goes down. And then because of less functioning, the ability to secrete and absorb goes down. So what is the impact of that? If I give a medicine like ibuprofen that's filtered through the kidneys, that's going to stay in their blood longer because the kidneys aren't filtering it out. Or if I give a medicine like oxycodone to an elderly patient with bad kidneys, that oxycodone is going to stay in their blood longer. So they're not going to need as high of a dose as a young person would who's going to metabolize that quicker. So we've got to really be careful with the elderly. And there's a phrase in healthcare that says, start low and go slow, which means if, I have, if the doctor puts an order in of 5 or 10 milligrams of oxycodone, I'm going to start with a 5, and I'm going to give it the full 4 hours before I redose again. Or it might even take five or six hours for them to need a redose because they're old and their kidneys aren't as functioning. And we have to be careful, too, when we look at, and they're, they're going to expect you to know this stuff, like ibuprofen is filtered by the kidneys. So if you have a patient on dialysis and the doctor puts in ibuprofen or some other anti-steroidal, um, in, in, anti-inflammatory, then you need to be careful with that, like aspirin and Aleve, which is naproxen, and ibuprofen, those are all filtered by the kidney. We don't want to give those to patients that have failed kidneys because it's just going to build up on their blood. Tylenol goes through the liver. So we, who should we not be giving Tylenol to? Who did we say have bad livers? Drinkers, yeah. People with, you know, liver failure, liver disease, people with hepatitis or you know, alcohol issues we should not be giving a lot of Tylenol to. And that's one thing I learned at the jail. Some of the inmates get mad because they need a doctor's order to have Tylenol or ibuprofen. But in a hospital setting, I can't just reach in my pocket and give someone some ibuprofen at the bedside. We have to have a doctor's order for any medicine we give a patient because we don't know what their liver and kidney function is. So that's for the doctor to decide if ibuprofen or Tylenol is appropriate. And because the kidney can't secrete that hormone renin, it can't control blood pressure very well either. So as a result of that, sometimes we get really low pressures in some patients or we get high pressure. High blood pressure is more common 
So we, those patients need blood pressure medicine. And a big mistake that people make, and I've heard it from my own relatives, is, oh, I'm going off my blood pressure because my blood pressure, I'm going off my blood pressure medicine because my blood pressure has been just perfect lately. Does that make sense? Why are they on the blood pressure medicine? Because it was high. So the blood pressure medicine brought it down. So now do we go off of it? No. I had an argument with a relative I'm very close with, and I said, so are, you, are your kidneys younger? Is that why you're going off of it? Because they're better than the average person who's in their 70s? Well, no, I guess not. I said, yeah, you shouldn't do that. And I, I, we get along well. I wasn't being mean. I said, you shouldn't do that. That would be a bad idea. Because a lot of people go off their medicine, and then they get this rebound hypertension, and then they're in the hospital. So never stop blood pressure medicine unless a doctor says, yeah, let's taper off. But you don't just stop cold turkey, because that causes um, dangerous high blood pressure. And the elderly, too, um, don't have good thirst mechanisms for keeping their fluid levels up, so they dehydrate quicker. And the kidneys don't kick in <coughs> to secrete ADH and pull fluid back to the blood when they're dehydrated, so they're, they get dehydrated very quickly. So we have to tell our elderly people in the hospital especially, drink water. When you see that water pitcher sitting there full with all the ice melted, you have to say, is there another fluid you would rather have? Can I get you some Jello? Because Jello's a fluid, ice cream's a fluid. They love ice cream. Something to get their fluid levels up, because you can't just let them sit there and not drink. Babies, too. When babies have vomiting and diarrhea, they can dehydrate very quickly, because their kidneys are not as efficient at controlling fluid losses with ADH and aldosterone. So you got to really watch babies and the elderly with diarrhea and vomiting. All right, so that concludes our discussion of the, the urinary system. And on the back side of that worksheet that I have in the Blackboard folder, this one, you can go through and answer those questions, and then I'll post an answer key.